Hoff is here. Uh, Z is here. And I am here as well here. And uh, we have Chris Rose, I believe, on the Twisted Tea Hard Iced Tea Hotline. Uh, Chris, um, I, thank you so much for your time, bud. Um, your, your reaction to yesterday, and it was storybook, pal. It really was. It was. Guys, I appreciate you having me on today. Um, it was a uh, – it was surreal, like, watching the game. As, as you guys know, with my NFL network duties, I'm watching with a bunch of guys that I'm very close with and have been for a dozen years. Um, they know where my passions lie. Um, as far as the game went, it was great to see them resemble the team that we thought that they could be in the preseason. Nathan, when we were doing the games, yeah. and Bo, when we were talking about mm-hmm. it. That part was special. Uh, the rest of it, obviously, I thought a lot about you guys and, and you, Nathan, and Andrew up there in the booth. And and obviously, you've got Jim and his, his family. Um, you know, these jobs that we get are, they're more than just jobs. We are connective tissue to communities, to fan bases. There's nothing that gets people excited, riled up frustrated, passionate, loving, energized, deflated, more so than the sports world. Uh, We go buy jerseys of our favorite players. We don't do that for our favorite actors or our favorite musicians or politicians. We don't do that. We do it for our athletes because we love the way this makes us feel. And so when you get people who are have the responsibility of telling the story and connecting the organizations and the players and the athletes and the coaches to the fans that's a that's a huge duty yeah. and the way that Jim did it was incredible it really it combined the perfect tone of seriousness when he needed that he would sprinkle in great humor and a guy who needed it over 25 years when we saw as many losses as we did, it would have been very easy for him to be a caustic, bitter, and that is so not who he was. And I just think we're all thankful as Brown fans that we had him in our lives for 25 years calling games and for almost 40 years in, the, in this community. Did you, watching that game, we've talked about it, I kind of ha- felt this way, Hoff said he felt this way uh Did you just know they were going to win that game? Like, did you just feel like it it just had to be that way? Well, when when Bateman and Hamilton both had footballs in their mitts and didn't catch them, like, those are usually places that, that are made against the Browns. And so when they didn't, I was like, what's going on here? Like, it just, you're like, okay, this is it. And even... As I'm watching the game, my oldest son, Josh, is texting me. He's like, we're going to do it, aren't we? I was like, I think so. He's like, come on, Dad. This is, like, different. And I was like, you know what, bud? You're right. So, yeah, it was uh, it was excruciating watching that last drive, but it was uh, the minute the ball sailed out of the end zone at the end, it was great. It was great. Yes, it was. Rosie, it's Joe. Good to speak with you. It's been so long since I uh, saw you in London a few days ago. So you're across the pond. That's a across stateside conversation. Uh, hope your trip to Paris was well and you finally got to sleep a little bit. I know when we were doing the game in London, not a lot of shut-eye for you with the time change no. and everything. Um, but I'm just curious with your experience with Jim Donovan, if you have any good anecdotes of times that you've spent with him or things that you've possibly learned from him over the years and as you have gotten to know him in his role with the Cleveland Browns? So it's interesting. You know, I haven't lived in Cleveland for basically since I was a a kid in college. That was a long time ago. Um, But I, you know, once I became a professional in the same business that Jim Donovan did and once I started kind of covering the Browns and coming around practices, that's kind of where our relationship started to grow. And then obviously in 2023, um, myself and Andrew split, split duties while Jim was taking care of his health. And all I can tell you is that he was great 
during that time. Um, it was a job that even though I dreamt of doing it as a kid, I didn't want to do it in that situation. And the first night I had a game was that Monday night or week two in Pittsburgh. Yep. And about an hour before kick, Jim sends me a text. He goes, have the time of your life. You're going to crush it. And um, that just it kind of put me at ease. And I appreciated it so much that a guy who – he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to send me a note. Uh, we weren't close friends, for instance. But he reached out and he thought enough of me and – and the respect for the position of, of calling the Browns games on radio to just say, hey, listen, go enjoy yourself, go relax. And then, of course, the first place, the tip pick six. I was like, Jim, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> Help. Oh, I remember that one. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> Looking at you being like, oh, man, welcome. Welcome, welcome to the booth, yeah. brother. And then Nick Chubb in yeah, the yeah, second worry, quarter. Nathan, I, like, won't, I won't repeat what was said during the commercial <laughs> break right after that. <laughs> you know, you're talking about Jim and just, you know, to see the outpouring of support. You're in this industry where, you know, people know you through your voice and they know you because they've listened to you and, the thing that I just keep going back to that is so powerful to me is just what a big orbit he had, right, and how universally beloved that he was. And I think that, you know, for, for Cheryl and Megan, just to see the world at large react this. We just had Mike Tirico on who shared great words. We heard from Kevin Harlan right before that. We heard Collinsworth last night on the broadcast. But there aren't many like that, not only in his style, it's what he wanted to do his whole life, but to be that genuine and to be that beloved is an incredibly powerful connection that he had, as you mentioned, connective tissue for Browns fans worldwide. Yeah, I mean, we've, I gotta be honest with you. In Cleveland, we have had the good fortune of having some amazing, amazing voices call our games. And for me as a kid, I wanted to be Nev Chandler, who, you know, was the voice of the Browns in the eighties. And that, that was really kind of during the, the glory years of when I was growing up winning five division titles and making the AFC championship in three of four seasons and stuff like that. You know, Joe Tate, the legendary voice of the Cleveland Cavaliers, Tom Hamilton, who's done it for three decades for, for the guardians now and Jim. And it's just, it is so special when you have those people that are here that want to immerse themselves in a community that don't want to use Cleveland as a stepping stone that want to be something to everybody in this town. And I imagine that his family does take solace in that, in the fact that this is a business where people are constantly taking shots at you. I can't stand the way this person calls a game or what this person says on TV. When you're universally loved, that is a rarity, man. Yeah. That is a rarity. It's and I not once did I ever hear, Yeah, Jim's okay. He's he's okay he's okay at play by play. What you always heard was he is great. He is energetic. He tells a tremendous story. He paints an incredible picture and he has an aura of positivity that is not found in a franchise that doesn't have a ton of great moments in the last two and a half decades it really is it's something special and i think we could probably all learn something from jim that's why uh bakes rookie year once he came in and the and the change happened 2020 in covid where you guys were the entire conduit i mean it was all that's missing is all of you and all of that oh. um and 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 also uh, last season when he was able to return. I mean, that's that's why those all meant so much because what you just described with, with Nev, Chris, Jim didn't have that. It was kind of the only thing missing. He did not have that consistent success season right. in and season out, being with calling playoff games and, and being able to do those things and to go to Pittsburgh and call a playoff win, to go to Kansas City and on the precipice of getting a vi victory in that one. and all He didn't that. even get to go to Pittsburgh. I don't think that's he true. ever he got didn't. to call a playoff game in person, a victory in a playoff game in oh, person. That's, that's right, because he was. you were the only one there. I was there. You were there. That's right. In an um, empty stadium. Yeah. 
Oh my God, that's right. But you, he, he got to call that game. Got to call that game. Yes. Um, and so that that's great. Of course, but that and and the Jets game. You, you think about all Jets of game, the, yeah. the Jets game with Bake, the rookie year too. Like oh, all yeah. of those things, the winning. He deserved that winning. Damn it, he did. Yep. Yes, he most certainly, most certainly did. And I mean, you think about the Jets game last year. You think about the Steelers game where he comes back and smashes the guitar and you win on DTR, leads an improbable game-winning drive against the Steelers defense, and D Hop puts it through. Yeah, he was. That's the that's the only thing that he didn't have was winning and cu- getting the an AFC championship game, a home playoff game, all the things that in other cities, you know, if you're the voice of the Kansas City Chiefs, you would probably take that for granted that's like <laughs> automatic um but it didn't matter and his greatness was still unparalleled his passion was unparalleled and it is kind of remarkable and obviously you know I think so many people obviously want the Browns win that game but uh, that's what we I wish we had won a Super Bowl so Jim could have called you know mm-hmm. for Jim yeah um and you know obviously hopefully that still comes to be in the in the future but yeah that's that's what makes it even more remarkable to be it's one thing to be beloved, and you think about even we talk about sometimes uniforms. Well, those uniforms are associated with them winning, and so people like them, yeah. even though maybe they're not the best or whatever. Could I'm sure it happens with you know voices of a team that just does nothing but win. You love these guys because they're the voices of winning. For Jim to be this beloved, and quite frankly, was not the voice of winning or you know Super Bowls or greatness or all right. of those things, and it didn't matter. No, that's remarkable. No, that goes to what I said earlier. It, him it, and this man, it's incredible. Right. In fact. Guys, he might he might have the worst record of any play by play guy ever. If you think about it. Like that is in, that's incredible. That's but funny, he walked but in like yeah. like like the team won eighty percent of the games when he called it. Like that's that's think of how upset we all get, like when our teams don't win. It's it's heartbreaking. It's frustrating. It's yes. All of that sort of stuff. And I'm telling you, for people that aren't in this industry the number of people you'll meet who are just, you know, after decades of working, they're like, oh, got to travel to another game. I've got to cover this. I've got to get on this flight. It is a wonderful business to be in. Are there parts of it that are fresh? Of course there are. It's the best. But when you would talk to Jim, there wasn't anything but the excitement, the electricity of being at a ball game of wanting to tell a great story and paint a picture. And he loved every minute of it. And the thing I, one of the many things I always appreciated about his style was that yet he works for the Browns, but he's honest. Yep. Mm -hmm. We as fans want honesty. We don't always want to hear that everything's perfect, that everything is ideal, because it's not. The ebbs and flows from year to year are uh, – they'll take you on an emotional roller coaster that you have to double-tuck your seatbelt to make sure that you're ready for it. And uh, when things weren't going great, he would tell us that. And even if he didn't want to hear it, I thought it was really, really important, and it's something that I think that a lot of us that are in this business can take to heart. One of the things, Chris, that – I get to tell people about you of our few times we've got to work together that makes it so enjoyable for me is that you bring that energy and that excitement, that enthusiasm to every game. You know, that was the theme for our production meetings going into the one in five new, uh, new England Patriots, um, versus the one in five Jacksonville Jaguars. It's like, Hey guys, this is the only game on TV show that energy. And I'm like, I'm with Chris Rose. This is going to be fun. (laughs) I don't care if this is the one in five Super Bowl. And I think that's one of the things that you do the best. And I'll, you know, maybe say that it's partly because you grew up in Cleveland. And so that, that's part of the fabric of who you are. And it comes across when you are on the air. But give us a little context because I think that's maybe the thing that um, we should highlight the most about Jim is that he was so good and so beloved. Even though when I was there, we went one in 31 my last two seasons. And Jim was the same energetic guy going into every single one of those games. And he brought joy with everything he did. And even in the good and the bad, there was joy behind it. And an optimism that I think seeped through the fan base. And that's why he was such a perfect conduit between the players and the fans. Because he was able to give you the emotions of both sides. 
and sometimes situations that were really hard where probably most people in that business would be just mailing it in or just super grumpy. And nobody wants to hear that, right? They, no. they want to hear that energy and excitement because as fans, you think about the players on the field, what a blessed opportunity they have to go be able to play a kid's game for a King's ransom. And it's the same thing when you're in the booth. And so maybe just give us a little context about how you were able to do that. And then how somebody like Jim could do it over and over again for a team that hadn't had the success, hadn't had the Super Bowls. Real quick, Chris, let me just hop in here. Gibbe will know this. Jim did a very good job of when he was feeling down or wanted to voice a frustration that it was during a commercial break. And then <laughs> well, maybe would, that's part of it. That's the secret. <laughs> and then he would come back on the radio. Sometimes my favorite things come to on. listen to on the sidelines were the commercial breaks. <laughs> yes. And he got a little bit of some Beautiful. hard truths. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Come on, Nathan. The secrets. Come on, keep the secret sauce secret. <laughs> come on. Um, but it is important from this standpoint, and I think that, you know, without having talked to Jim about this, I am sure, based on listening to his body of work, that he felt the same way, that someone always cares, mm. okay? It doesn't matter if at the end of the season you're 2-14 and 14 heading into week 18. Somebody out there cares, right? Yep. Um, and that's the thing is that you owe it. When you're doing a broadcast, you owe it that you, it should be your Super Bowl every week. I mean, just think about what it is we get to do. I don't know how good an athlete Jim was. I know how poor an athlete I was. So the <laughs> only way I could be involved in professional sports was to do this. And so it's why we all work as hard as we do. It's why we're passionate about what, you know, what lies ahead. It's why when somebody says, oh, you you got a crappy game. You've got the Jags and the Patriots. I'm like, wait a second. If you had told 10-year-old me that I'd be standing next to a Hall of Fame lineman doing the only game in the world at that time in London, like, heck yeah, that's yeah. the Super Bowl. And as I said, I think that Jim totally felt that way about every assignment he ever had. And that's an – I mean, that's an important thing. When you're a local news or sports anchor, every story has got to mean something to somebody and if you're going to dedicate time to a sports cast you damn well better make sure that it's the best 90 second piece or three minutes what however long you're covering the story make people care about it and that's something that he did extremely well in four decades of cleveland sports chris you're the best buddy yes thanks for well joining said. us taking a little bit of time today Absolutely, guys. I appreciate it. I know it's a sad, sad time. It's, it's, you guys are hurting bad. And Nathan, you and I have, have obviously chatted. Uh, we as a fan base are crushed. Um, I think we just we have to know that for like two and a half decades, we were treated to something special yeah. with the Browns over the airwaves. And for four decades in Cleveland, uh, we had a guy who didn't even grow up here. And it sure as hell sounded like it did. So we all love Jimmy and we appreciate him and respect the hell out of him and his family.